So sculpin the secretome. So it will bring from genes to proteins and to cell biology, essentially. And uh, this is a sort of a nice way to see a cell. A cell has a membrane, has receptors here, and sends ligands or receives ligands, right? And the communication of cells is performed, essentially, by protein objects that are either receptors, this guy here, or a ligand. And if they, they can work only if they fold properly. It's not a linear information that now that we read, but is a three-dimensional information. So protein folding is essential. And you know that the Levinthal paradox uh, instructs us that one single protein of uh, 300 amino acids can, in principle, uh, assume uh, 10 to the 30 uh, possible conformation, of which only one is the, is, is the good one. Right? So cells need to be very attentive to send the wanted message in the right time for the, for the, for the, for the, for the right duration. So fidelity of the message is very important. We don't want our cells to make guffs, because a guff in a cell is, um, can be lethal, right? You can have tumors. At the same time, cells must be able to produce huge amounts of proteins. Imagine a plasma cell here that has to respond to a pathogen. Now, the production of antibodies should, should be faster than the rate of replication of the virus. You don't want this to obtain against your, the virus that you're obtaining, yet you're using to cure your patients, of course. But if this is an nasty virus, you want to, your antibodies to be produced fast. So we have a problem of coupling fidelity and efficiency in the, um, in the protein factory. And these reasoning started when I was in Cambridge with Cesar Milstein, and uh, that, that many of you know. And uh, I, I am glad to uh, show this picture here, because some of you, I'm sure, uh, have uh, read his papers. And so if we go back to efficiency and fidelity, we have a big problem here with the primary um, Antibody, the, the antibody that it dominates the primary immune response with is IgM. This is a huge molecule. It is 40 nanometers wide, 4 nanometers thick. It is 21 polypeptides of 24, 51 glycons, 100 disulfide bonds. Right? So a huge affair. How do cells manage to produce thousands of antibodies like this per second, which is what they can do? And so they need to build a very, very efficient protein factory. And you see this happen, happening in a B cell that differentiates into a plasma cell. So these guys here are now inhabiting your lymph nodes, your spleen. They are small cells. You, see hardly, can, you can hardly see a, 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 a cytoplasm here, let alone an endoplasmic reticulum. They essentially do nothing. Or such lazy guys acting as sentinels. But when the antigen comes, in a few days, they become these objects. These are really short-lived kamikazes that make a lot of antibodies and then die. And they must die. Right? So this system we have played in the lab uh, with a lot to study the biogenesis of an organelle. You see here you can study how the ER is made. And that has given some uh, good results, secretion. Lifespan control, because these are very long-lived and these are short-lived, and I will mention. And then proteostasis, of which I will talk. We don't, I won't talk to you uh, about redox stasis and signaling, that next time I come to, 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 to Trieste, we will discuss this. So to summarize the events, you have a short, uh, a small B cell that uh, stays there. When the antigen comes, this proliferates. Undergoes affinity maturation, but we won't talk about this. And it differentiates into a plasma cell that secretes humongous amounts of antibody for a few days and then dies. So let's see the first phase, what happens. And this is just a summary slide of a very nice piece of work that was done almost 10 years ago by Elko Van Anken in the lab. So this is the production of the factory of the antibody. These are ER resident proteins. You remember how right? this change is dictated by the fact that the ER accumulates here. 
And this is antibodies. So you what you see here is very interesting. For two days, the cell produces the factory. Only afterwards, it starts secreting. Then secretion is really steep. And you see the difference you will see in a moment between the rate of production and the, the, the size of the factory sends the factory in a crisis, in a proteostatic crisis, which kills the cell. Okay? So let's see what is the product. So this is antibody secretion. A day zero of we have a system in which we can uh, follow differentiation very nice. And this is a, a short label with 35S. You see this is the heavy chain that is produced. Day zero, one, two, you see essentially nothing happens. And then boom, this is hundredfold more, almost more intense than before. Right? So the factory is now active. So if you think about an ecologically correct factory, you induce the production, you increase the production, you will increase the garbage production, and so you should increase proteasomes, which is what cells use to degrade the bad uh, products. And much to our surprise, we discovered that proteasomes go down. So the load goes up, and the capacity of proteasome goes down. This is a crisis. This is an ecological crisis, if you wish. Right? Production exceeds um, clearance. And this has consequences. First of all, essentially, this ratio is, in a way, provides a counter for antibody production. We want, ideally, I'm from Genoa, so I'm very stingy. Right? I don't want my plasma cells to produce any more antibodies than I need, because that would be wasted ATP. But certainly, I don't want to, my plasma cells to produce too few of them, otherwise I die. Right? So how do I count the antibodies that I have already secreted? Typically, we have a counter, right? When we go to the microscope, we tick, 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 tick. Right? So, but there, says, what is the counter? Perhaps is the accumulation of garbage. Yeah? So you can see what happens in a system like that. This is what you saw before, right? ER, proteins, redox. Uh, peroxyredoxin-4 is a very nice protein, but we don't have time to talk. Production of IgM. Proteasomes go down. And look what happens to BIM and BUX. We, these are apoptotic executors, which are substrates of the proteasome. So the production of antibodies competes with the degrade... Sorry, the, degra the production of excessive antibodies competes with fewer proteasomes for the degradation of the apoptotic factor, and so the cell dies. That has implication in the clinics, of course, because multiple myeloma, as you see, as you, as, as you may know, is a tum tumor of plasma cells. And maybe, if you don't know, now you know, it is now not cured, but treated with proteasome inhibitors. This is a tumor which is particularly sensitive to proteasome inhibitors. So why is that? Well, because the, this is a tumor of plasma cells, so it is already on the verge of a nervous breakdown, let's call it, right? Because it is already producing a lot of antibodies and has fewer proteasomes, right? So that this is the load and this is the capacity. This ratio will tell us whether a cell is sensitive or not. And this we measured in patients, primary patients from the, from the clinics as, uh, what's remember, <coughs> I am an hematologist after all, so I, I, I like to, to see. You see, this one is a capacity, very low capacity, and this is a, a LD50 or proteasome inhibitors in vitro. So we take uh, cells from the bone marrow, we purify CD138 cells, and then we uh, test apoptotic threshold. And you see there is a very nice linear correlation between the capacity and the sensitivity. Now this is important because 50% of the patients respond and 50% of the patients don't respond. So we don't want to treat these guys because that will be only toxic, right? We wanted to treat this. What do we do with this? Well, what we do, what we can do with this is, <clears throat> and you can find the results in this paper, I think, um, is that if we induce stress, we can turn these cells, the resistant cells, into a sensitive one. And that, so far, we have done this by blocking autophagy, by inducing redox stress, oxidative stress, and by blocking, uh, using a, a, a drug that induces protein misfolding in the endoplasmic reticulum by blocking N-glycosylation, right? So 
this is has some promises, right? <coughs> but what happens when we have problems in the protein factory? Well, this is, you can recognize, Chaplin sort of trying to get to understand how cells secrete antibodies. And something, in some cases, this is a very simplified version of ER proteostasis. If in a closed system you inject a protein by a ribosome here, then this protein must get out either because the cell secretes it or because the cell degrades it. Okay? If the sum, if, if the entry of a protein exceeds the exit, inevitably this compartment will increase. Okay, look what happens when synthesis exceeds exit. So these are called Russell bodies. You can, here, here you see a normal ER vesicle and you see these blobs. These blobs are full of aggregated immunoglobulin which aggregates faster than it can be extracted by the proteasome. Uh, and so this is a ER storage disease. Right? You can find it in alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. You can find it in the liver. And there are about 40 diseases, uh, genetic diseases, which are due to uh, these, these conditions. Right? So an interesting question that we asked in the lab, how do these guys grow? Right? So this is the work of Maria Mossuto, who came from uh, the Dobson lab and then unfortunately left ours because she's really very good. So she used a very interesting tag, which I suggest you, those of you who are interested in cell biology to use, HALO. HALO is, an, is, a, is, a, is a bacterial enzyme that is being modified such as to bind covalently ligands. These ligands can be fluorescent or can be bound to beads, and so this is very good for immunoprecipitation and proteomics as well, right? So here we have a mutant immunoglobulin, the mutant immunoglobulin which was causing these objects, which we have now <coughs> engineered to contain halo. This allows a nice trick because since, since this is a covalent bond, which is formed between the ligand and the protein, you can use this technique to do pulse chase experiment at the single cell level, right? By labeling with the color and then changing color, okay? So we can ask, how do aggregates grow? So what you do, you express the aggregation-prone uh, immunoglobulin, stain for 24 hours with a green ligand, and then wash, and then go with a red ligand. And you perhaps see, you can see it very clearly here, these onions, right? You have a seed, a, yellow, uh, a, a green seed with a red ring, right? You see it? What, why is the, we call it the onion model? Because this means that in the first 24 hours, an aggregate has formed, which we painted green, which was liquid, has now become solid, and then some other proteins in a sort of liquid form, you see it's very, very regular, the rim around, right? Goes there and then solidifies. It's like when you paint your, paint your wall, right? The, the, the paint is liquid, you paint it, then it sticks. And then you go with another hand, right? So this is, we can now film the growth of these aggregates and sort of play uh, with that, of course, right? We want to, perhaps, in these myelomas which have these aggregates, aggregates in the, you know, in the, in the degenerative field, uh, um, the, the general disease field has been, have been considered as toxic. Uh, now they seem to be defenses for the cell. So in a, in a tumor model, we want to perhaps soli um, dissolve these aggregates, such as to increase the toxicity of the protein, whereas we want to limit the, the toxicity of, uh, of the protein in uh, uh, liver diseases, for example. Okay. So presto e bene in the factory is the title of my seminar uh, and means how do we couple fidelity with efficiency, right? Presto e bene, our mothers normally tell us how presto e bene raro avviene. Well, it does avviene in the protein factory and with this protein that, as we said, is very difficult to make. And if it does happen is because a few workers in the protein factory are um, 
really very smart, were operating very smartly. So what I will show you in the next two or three slides is how this IgM is made and how a single plasma cell is able to produce a couple of thousands of them per second, all very nicely organized, all uh, it weighs on the protein degradation machinery, as we said, so there is some waste, but I think it is really amazing how efficient and precise this protein factory can be. And it does so by sort of splitting the job. A heavy chain is made, a light chain is made. First of all, H2L2 complexes are made in the rough endoplasmic reticulum. You see this roughness is ribosomes by the help of a protein, a very important chaperone, which is called BIP. BIP was discovered as heavy chain binding protein, okay, as it happens. Now, when this H2L2 complex is made, it proceeds, helped by this protein, which is a lectin, and it, it is brought forward through the Golgi, and then if everything goes nicely, it will be secreted. Otherwise, it will be recognized by a protein called ERP44 and brought back. And I'll show you now in a two or three slides how the thing works. So BIP recognizes a heavy chain and helps its assembly with mu2, with a light chain to form a mu2L2. At the end of the mu2L2, you have two uh, thiols, exposed thiols, which are used to make the disulfide bond, which stabilize this complex. Okay, this protein. If it maintains thiols exposed, it is recognized by ERP44. ERP44, you will see, forms a mixed disulfide bond with this thiol and brings back the protein for the other trip. If everything is fine, it works. So this, we called it post-ER quality control, and essentially the paper, um, um, I can find the details here. This was a, 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 a nice result by um, Tiziana Nelli, who discovered ERP44 at first. Uh, I forgot to, to add here an interesting uh, slide. You remember this guy, Ergic. It will come in a moment. Ergic is an exameric lectin, OK? IgM are examers, because you have five subunits plus a J chain, or six subunits. So this, is a, this Ergic is the platform onto which you put all your single monomers to close the circle, right? If you want to make Imagine that you have six slides of a, slices of a pizza, and you have to rebuild your pizza. Right? You need to put yourself on a table. Otherwise, it will be very floppy like that. And if you don't have this ergic 53, or the glycan that binds to ergic 53, then instead of making hexamers, you make megamers, which are spiral molecules. You continue to add uh, huge, and, and, and you have these huge uh, proteins uh, which are secreted and can uh, precipitate in the blood and, for example, sustain. It, they, these are cryoglobulins, for those some of you uh, um, may remember. <laughs> OK. So then ERP44 became a very interesting molecule. Stop me if I'm saying something that is not clear, of course, right? I mean, try to. <clears throat> and ERP44 is, has a very intense social life. As I said, it performs post ER quality control, IgM, SUMF1 is the protein discovered by uh, Andrea Ballabio, sulfatase modifying uh, enzyme, adiponectin is a protein which is essential in diabetes, and then very many IL-12, uh, maybe we should look at the, your 1200 uh, secretome uh, to see, uh, to look for uh, additional substrates, okay? It binds and inhibits IP3 receptors, so it controls calcium uh, signaling. It binds and inhibits ERO1. This is the main oxidase in the, the plasmic reticulum, is what generates the R stress, um, uh, oxidative stress in the endoplasmic reticulum, because it produces H2O2. This is a flavoprotein that is used for making disulfide bonds, and it produces H2O2, which is a signal and a toxic affair. It binds ergic and controls transport and KDL receptors. So, it was a very, very important protein. It is, still is. And so we crystallized it, we solved the structure, and we discovered a PDI. This is a thyroid oxygen molecule. This is the cysteine in the active side, which is used to make mixed disulfide bonds with the clients. This is the B and B prime domain. These are uh, sort of 
very conserved domains in evolution, and most auxiliary ductases are uh, belong to this uh, to this family. Okay. The surprise came since we know that this is the active site. If you look at, well in the crystal, you have this tail that starts from here, goes all the way, and hides the active site. So we have a dumb chaperone here, because if you imagine that my mouth is the active site, the chaperone in the crystal is organized like that. So how can it do? Well, when you see something like that, you can immediately think that any chaperone must bind and release, bind and release. If it binds and doesn't release, it's a dominant negative. If it doesn't bind, it's totally useless. So we thought, well, this is how the thing works, right? And indeed, that's easy to show. You delete the tail, and you see that not only you have a few clients bound, but very many clients. This is the same. This is the same, much more intense. But you see that a number of client proteins, a protein is much less specific. It now becomes right, aggressive for a, a wide number of, uh, of substrates. So this is a movement. This is a me mechanism. This is a protein in the closed, uh, right? The client is not bound. The tail is opened, the client is bound, right? And this is how this chaperone works. Well, there is an interesting thing. You remember what is the function of this, this, uh, this chaperone. It goes to the Golgi, captures the protein that it has to be captured, and brings it back to the ER, okay? And it does so by the KDL receptor. Do you know what is a KDL receptor? KDLs, here. KDL receptor, essentially, is present in the Golgi, when it sees a protein with the KDL, BIP has a KDL, or the chaperons, ERP44 has a KDL-like molecule, when chaperons that are not designed to be secreted, but they are designed to work in the, pro in the factory, these are workers, so they should stay in the factory, not go to the market, are come to the Golgi, the KDL receptor sees them and brings them back uh, to square one. Okay? So the KDL is that at the very end of this tail. So we figured that KDL is invisible in the closed molecule. Indeed, we couldn't see it in the crystal, but visible and well nicely exposed in the open structure. Okay? And indeed, this is a nice experiment performed by Stefano Vavasor in the lab. What Stefano in the crystal, you, you, we knew that this cysteine 29 forms a hydrogen bond with a threonine here in the tail. So Stefano said, well, we can make this hydrogen bond a covalent disulfide bond by putting a cysteine here. Right? So he replaced the threonine with a cysteine. And so now we have a, an autistic chaperone that always stays close. Right? And indeed, this protein is now secreted, right, with the same efficiency than when you, than you obtain when you delete the KDL. So when the KDL is there, the protein is not secreted, so the KDL receptor is doing its job, right? You delete the KDL, the protein is very nicely secreted, and you, delete, you, you, you put a, a lock here, and the protein is secreted, right? KDL receptor cannot see it any longer. So the simultaneous exposure of client and KDL receptor binding sites allow retrieval, right? That's a nice model, right? I go there, capture, bring back, release for another attempt. So the question became what regulates the uh, tail movements? And the answer is very easy in a way uh, and, and elegant. We know that there is a pH gradient. In the ER, the pH is neutral, 7.1, we measured in our cells. And it goes down, uh, it decreases 0.5 of a unit in the Golgi. So we thought, well, maybe we knew that the ergic 53, you know, the carrier on is um, pH sensitive. We knew that the KDL receptor is pH sensitive in the opposite direction. And we predicted that ERP44 would be pH sensitive, open here, close there. And indeed, is, this is what we showed in vivo and in vitro. So we are now sure. And you, you will see in a moment a, 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 an experiment. So this is the model. In the endoplasmic reticulum, the pH is neutral. 
Ergic is active, binds the client, and brings it to the Golgi. As it accompanies the, 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 the client to the Golgi, since this is an examer, and the IgM and hadiponectin are examers, it massages the client so as to make an examer. If the examer is made, the client can go. If the examer is not made, the protein is mature, immature, then it will be recognized by ERP44 that meanwhile has opened right, the mouth, is ready to bite, and it is ready to attach itself to the KDA receptor and bring the thing back. At the neutral pH, the thing is dissolved and you have another attempt of folding, right? So what is that senses the pH? Uh, there is the protonation of this system that opens the tail. Uh, to make it very simple, it's a bit more complex, uh, obviously. And then if you want to, do, to see the detail, you can go to the... And then, and this is the last part, and it will finish. Um, there is another interesting thing. So this, we, we call it la cuisina in the lab. This closes. And then this is some, something here, right? Protonation. The system here is not protonated, it's closed. If it is pro protonated, the hydrogen bond is, cannot be formed and the thing can open, right? In the elbow here, there are very, very conserved histidines, which obviously raised our interest because, you know, histidines are pH sensitive, right? But they are not only pH sensitive. And so Sara Sanino, a really outstanding PhD student from Naples, uh, I found that Naples is the mine, as Fulvio knows very well. Yeah. So what is the strange thing? Histidines are here, and this is a floppy region, right? In the crystal, we couldn't solve this region. Yet, that floppy re region is extremely conserved. Here you have uh, um, arthropods, right? You see, it's pretty, pretty much the same. And these histidines, these three red histidines never change. Okay? These blue histidines appear uh, with elegance, right? They are not there in arthropods, but then they are always there uh, elsewhere. So we, these are numbers that, that we have now very, very many names uh, for these, but A, B, and C are now essential. We know that they are essential for doing something. The first experiment that I just show you, uh, two experiments. So what, what you found so far, uh, and, um, you, what I told you so far is published. This part is also published, and then the last two or three slides are unpublished material, which is very exciting. We are very much excited. So you see this, and immediately this obvious experiment that Sarah did. Let's delete this little bit and see what happens, right? So she deleted uh, this huge unsolved then affair and, and replaced it with a short linker just to allow. And what we saw, a very surprising thing that the thing, this is the mutant, this is the endogenous protein, the mutant is secreted even though the KDL is there. Okay? So that was strange because why should things there in a floppy region, uh, you know, sort of control the opening of the tail? Um, there, has, there must be some histidine binding factor that would open Right? You remember, here is the lacusina, and here there is an aprina, right? an opening device, which sort requires this histidines. Now, now um, we have all the single histidine mutants, and it is, I can tell you, it is sufficient to s modify a single one of these red histidines to have the same phenotype of the delta histidine uh, gemish. Right? Just remove the data for the sake of time. Is it possible? Now, I will tell you in the last two slides what is the histidine binding factor, OK? But there is a nice reasoning that you can imagine. Perhaps the client would keep and would open this tail, even in the absence of the uh, histidine binding factor, or even in the mutants that are not able to bind this um, hypothetical uh, histidine binding factor. And this is exactly what happens. And this is a very interesting uh, experiment. 
because here we have a protein that is normally secreted unless you give it ERP44. Now here we have a mutant that is normally secreted until you give it a client. So we have a secreted chaperone, because it's a mutant, and a secreted client, that together, none of them is secreted any longer. So what we call it here is a client-induced quality control, which is a very subtle thing that cells can do. Yeah? So you can send the chaperone far away in the ER Golgi region, until it finds a, a, a client that opens, exposes this KDL receptor, and brings it back. You will see why this is very important. Okay? So this is the model, client-induced retrieval, actually, that's a, that's a term. The protein without histidines goes to the Golgi, and it will be secreted unless it finds a, a client. Okay? So this also implies an interesting affair, which is, that some clients bind soon, ERO1, for example, some clients bind later. We can decide when it binds because secreted ERP40 is glycosylated, and so we can map as, right, the extent at which it proceeded along the sectory pathway looking at the, at the glycans that it contains. Right? So looking at this assay, we were able to show that, for example, SUMF sulfatase modifying factor is, is bound very late in the Golgi and then brought back, whereas ERP4, ERO1 is here, peroxyredoxin 4 is here, IgM is there, so it's very nice. Each substrate has its own uh, point of binding with the chaperone. Why is that? There is a pH gradient, and that is, you remember this is a pH sensitive molecule, but there is this histidine factor, histidine binding factor. So question, what is the histidine binding factor? Maybe some of you can guess what would three histidines, actually four histidines, uh, three histidines with agglutamate. Now, now we know the structure. What they can collate a metal. Can you imagine what metal is? Zinc. Zinc, right? Coordination. The zinc finger, you can do it. You can coordinate a zinc atom with two cysteines into histidines or uh, combinations of cysteine, histidines, and glutamates. And you can now purify ERP44, put it in vitro, and I told you that is a pH-sensitive molecule. Here we are measuring the exposure of this active site in ERP44 by a trick that, since there is a system there, we, 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 we measure uh, multi binding. Okay? And if the pH is 8, very little is bound. If you drop the pH to 6, much more is bound. But look what, at what happens when you add zinc into the, into the system. The protein is open also at pH, at neutral pH. If we now remove the histidines, zinc is no longer bound, and the protein remains pH sensitive. So zinc and pH regulate ERP44. Both concur to this progressive quality control. Okay. Can we show something of relevance for you in vitro? Yes. And now we do an experiment in which we have a HeLa cell. We equip it with this guy here, and a mutant that has no histidines. It's called ABCD because it lacks four of the five interesting ones, as it happens. And then we give hot zinc, radioactive zinc, right? So these are HeLa cells that overexpress this protein, halo ERP44, or the mutant that no longer binds zinc. Okay? And red is one, and green is there in this color code, in this experiment. And then you measure the uptake of hot zinc as a function of time. And this is zinc that slowly enters. It's probably bound to metallothionanes. Then it goes and is bound to zinc uh, containing transcri transcription factors. But if you have ERP44 active, now a lot of zinc is bound. Okay? And this is very important because zinc is essential for at least two things, for transcription factors and for metalloproteases, for example, among other things. Right? And is there a role for ERP44 in the biogenesis of zinc-containing metalloenzymes? And this I cannot 
give you the uh, identity of the proteins because this is still unpublished, but let me anticipate that, for example, here we have now knockout mice for ERP44, so we can measure their phenotype. It's a very interesting phenotype. And uh, uh, this is the enzymatic activity of uh, an enzyme, secreted enzyme that requires zinc, and you call it 100, and then you have a 40% decrease if uh, you insist that uh, are knockout for ERP44. It's not that they don't have any, but the rate at which they produce these uh, enzymes uh, is, is severely reduced. If you give t which is a, a, ke a chelator of zinc, you get about the same ratio. So this is a very important um, protein in the production of many, um, not only IgM, not only adiponectin, not only uh, SUMF1, but also metalloproteases, and they are interesting phenotypes. And I finish with uh, a little movie which, in which we compare cells that um, express full amount. These are uh, similar cells, essentially. Uh, knocked down, actually, in this case. And these are little movies. Do you know what is a gap-filling essay? Have you, right? So we call it gap filling essay. Somebody called it wound essay, but anyway, you measure the proliferation and migration of cells. These are tumor cells which have a full compound of ERP44 on the left, or they are knockdowns on the right. And this is particularly rewarding. Why is it one and one? They move. Something happens, yes. So this is accelerated, likely, because it's 48 hours, right? Uh, so this is where we're measuring the migration. And if you are interested, uh, you can follow later on. But these guys move. These are sort of still, you see. They don't move at all. And at the end, after 48 hours, these guys have filled the normal field, and these guys are still there, right? So this is a very impressive phenotype. We have other uh, interesting phenotype that lead us to uh, be very happy of having invested some time and money in this protein. Uh, this is very important for cardiac development. Uh, it controls IP3 receptor type 2, so our mice uh, succumb at day 10 um, um, when, uh, uh, IP, when cardiac development is driven by uh, IP3 receptor type, type 2. If you bring them a, uh, after that, uh, that moment, then they develop, but they are very tiny little mice with a very interesting phenotype. Next time I come here, I'll tell you. So the last slide is in a bit more colorful than in black and white. So ERP44 in the ER has a closed tail. It ignores zinc metallo enzymes and ignores ERO1-alpha. If ERO1-alpha comes here, it will find a protein which, owing to the low pH of the Golgi, the low pH that is determined by the presence of a Golgi pH regulator in the Golgi, right? The tail opens. Euro 1 is bound. KDL is exposed. And the thing is brought back to square one, right? If you are instead a NAPO enzyme, zinc metallo enzyme, these are proteases. So you don't want to activate a protease in the ER because the protease can chop nascent proteins that didn't fold yet. So you want to activate zinc enzymes later on. And this is performed by the presence of propeptides, but also by the fact that the zinc transporters are here in the Golgi. And they bind, zinc binds to ERP44. ERP44 recognizes the enzyme and as a transport, or as a, as a, as a uh, yes, it passes. We know now it passes zinc to the uh, enzyme, and the enzyme is happy to go. And so what I told you is that proteostasis is a signal, because you remember, it is very important for the development of a plasma cell. The last part of the development of, uh, of uh, plasma cells is driven by the, by the IgM, essentially, is facilitated. Uh, these becomes a target in myeloma and ER storage diseases. Uh, the ER, Golgi, the secondary pathway altogether is organized in stepwise, like a, an assembly line in a factory, sequential organization of the protein factor, in which 
each substrate finds a different condition, different pH, different zinc concentration, and God only knows how many other features, right? Zinc and pH we showed, but there are probably other things that generate a, a, a factory which is essentially constant, but is suitable for making 10 to the 11 different antibodies, for example, and a wide secretor, right? Several thousands of, uh, of uh, proteins. So thank you very much for your attention. And I hope that some of you may want to, become to, 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 to come to Milano, where not only opera and good soccer are there, but we hope also some good, good science. Yeah. <laughs>